today I want to talk about my top five surprises when I moved to the West from Iran at the age of 15. These are things I did not think about at all. They caught me completely off guard. And these are things that are not necessarily good. These are not things I wish we had in the West, but they exist. And if they were most surprising for somebody coming from Iran. Now, before I get into this list, there are some things that are absolutely good you know, I moved from Iran to Canada when I was 15. Uh, Canada has been absolutely good to me. This is uh, a place I have found a new home. Been able to make such progress that I think would have been virtually impossible given where uh, me and my family were in the society and scheme of things back in Iran. So that is not to say that the West does not have anything good and I'm going to go through the positive as well but there are some things that we need to talk about that are what I would call not the best or the bad that really surprised me and I'm going to give you the list and then we're going to go through them so here's my top five surprises when I moved to the West from Iran in a list number one the level of ignorance about the world outside of the West it's incredible number two gluttony is just something you, you cannot believe when you compare with outside of the West. Number three, which was really surprising, massive blind adherence to authority, authority figures or anyone perceived as an authority figure. Number four, any type of argumentation is frowned upon, not necessarily encouraged especially throughout the education system. Number five is the concept of a democracy and that the freedom that is heard outside of the West does not really translate to what it really is once you're inside the system. So that was my five surprises. I have a sixth bonus bad surprise I had. Racism, ageism. I could go on in a lot of different isms that exists that I did not think I was going to see in the West. So we're going to go through these five surprises because the interesting thing is I'm going to first introduce myself in case you haven't watched any of my videos. My name is Peruz Momeni, I'm the CEO and founder at EntrepreneurCorner.com. I also have a bunch of other companies, Bima and Swordsmart, and my guest today is, or co-host I should say, is Genia, who is the content manager at Bimo. Now, the interesting thing is, I brought Genia because we're gonna talk about our stories. Even though we have very different paths to Canada, and we're not the same age, we both arrived in Canada from our country of origin, at the age of 15. So the experiences have been within the same timelines of essentially development as a human being or member of society. It's a very interesting, that's a very good synergy we have. But mm -hmm. because Jenya is a different person, I want to see if she's what ha she's had that were similar to my experience and my surprises. And, and also she comes from a different country and she's going to tell you uh, her story versus the things that uh, you know what were the similarities versus differences in perception because obviously this is not a statistical study there's only two of us here today but the more agreement we have the more likely that this is true mm -hmm. the more disagreement we have the more likely that is just a perception however if you're new to entrepreneurcorner.com podcast everything we say all the time is always true we're never wrong that's just how we run our shows so you should believe everything we say and no kidding aside so Genia, why don't you i'm gonna tell i'm gonna tell uh, our, our audience about my experience in a bit but you want to tell us about your story and what were your perceptions about the bad and then we could go into the good i guess mm -hmm. after that Yes, so I was, uh, uh, my immigration to Canada is, again, as you mentioned, was uh, around the same age as you, 15 years old. And uh, I moved actually from uh, Ukraine 
but I am originally from Russia and uh, my family split our time between Russia and Ukraine because my father was, he's a retired nuclear engineer now, and he was building the nuclear power plant in the town of Energodar. And so we split our time between Russia, where I'm from. I'm from a town, a city in Siberia. We lived in Moscow for many years and also in this town of uh, Energodar. So I would say that I agree with many of your points. And I think uh, specifically, I would unite to the last two points that you said, you know, the, the perception of incredible freedom and democracy is actually very shocking to realize it's not so democratic and not so free when you come here and people make fun of you for your accent because they've never met somebody from your background. I moved to a very small town, actually with my family. There is a nuclear power plant in uh, Ontario called Ontario Power Generation. It's near Oshawa, but I went to a school, uh, high school in Bowmanville, which was a very small town back then. Lovely town, nothing but fond <laughs> fondness for it, but it was very, very radically Canadian. <laughs> and I mean Canadian that it was there were no there were no other foreign people in my high school so everybody was shocked by meeting me like hearing an accent so i think you know th what you said about you know the perceived freedom and democracy versus what you meet in terms of you know an experience of other cultures the fact that somebody has an accent somebody can't communicate as well and i had very very basic english <laughs> so it was tough at the, at the beginning but you know to some extent actually i'll kind of end my uh, little introduction with this i'm grateful that my parents moved to such a small town because i think if i lived in toronto i would have been able to let's say communicate in russian with many russian speakers here there's a a large russian speaking population here and uh, maybe i wouldn't have you know <laughs> gotten a hold of the english language as well i don't know uh, but but you know that was the learning experience i had uh, but we can actually uh, go ahead and go through your list because I do have something to add for every little thing. <laughs> so here's my first surprise when I moved to the West from Iran. First one was the level of ignorance about the world outside of the West. People here only know what's happening in the US, what's happening in Canada, maybe a little bit about the UK, and they don't know nothing about what's happening. They don't even know geographically. They, I told them I'm from Iran. They're like, Iraq? No, Iran. Okay, Iraq. No. Where is that? Is it right beside Iraq? Well, yeah, it is. Oh, okay. So it's in the north of it? No. You could tell nobody. I, I, I'm not talking about like people who were 15 my age. I'm talking about this person who was like my teacher, for example. Think about that. The teacher. Yes didn't know where essentially where I am from. But now it's not about that. It, obviously that's that shows the level of ignorance about what's happening outside, which makes the person very narrow-minded, narrow perspective, a little bit dangerous actually, because it's not good. You, a lot of other issues come from that because all of a sudden you also believe automatically that everything else you know must be the best which becomes problematic. And Jenny was, you know, talking about this is like, you know, for example, one of the reasons kids could bully somebody in school is because they think they're the best. Why else would you bully somebody, right? This, this person is inferior, you're, you're superior, you're just gonna bully them. One reason could be because you just don't even understand their world. Like you haven't even traveled. Like most people had traveled maximum to, let's say Mexico or US or Canada or UK, or like they went to, you know, maybe France or Italy for travel. That's it. They don't know anything else. Yes, Very different was... from Iran. Yes. But, and I guess it could be because Iran has such a immense place in history of humanity, essentially. And, yes. <laughs> and like our history books are like so massive. <laughs> Nobody likes history. Everybody loves history in Iran, but they don't like as a subject matter, like in school, because it's so hard to know, like so, so much history is like thousands of years of history. Mm -hmm. But because you have that, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. this place they conquered is now called Turkey. This place they used to be almost at its border. It's India. Because of that, you know, the whole entire world. 
And then you also talk about politics 24 seven. That's like the thing Persians love to talk about. <laughs> you come here and nobody wants to talk about politics. It's like, oh, I don't want to talk about politics. Are you kidding me? They're running your life. There's no different here. Yes, I actually had a very good uh, friend in university who was American. And it was right before the 2016 election. And I came up to him and I said, so who are you voting for? He looked at me like, you cannot ask that. He said, you don't ask that of a, an American. You can ask about basically anything, but <laughs> not who you're voting. Like, it is a taboo topic. You do not talk about that. So <laughs> you're right that, you know, it is completely off limits. I agree with you that it was a little bit, uh, I, I think, you know, I came from, a, I guess, a after Cold War situation there. And uh, some people knew Russia, but they actually totally thought it was still Soviet Union. <laughs> you know, it was, it was interesting. The, they didn't, yeah, like, I think that, you know, to some extent, that maybe is where uh, that not, I don't want to say bully, but, you know, that misunderstanding between people happened. They didn't know who I was, like, just like with you, you know, you're saying they don't know what, you know, where Iran is, or where Iran is in, even in history of humanity. So for them to place it and to understand you where you're coming from is a challenge. So hence misunderstanding, hence kind of like, I don't, again, I don't want to say bullying, but, uh, you know, th that kind of, kind of board between you and the other person. So it was very real in my school. I was, as I said, I was the only foreign person. <laughs> so my it was hard. second surprise when I moved to the West from Iran was the level of gluttony. The, one of the actual first things I recognized and maybe I'm just going to this topic was the level of unnecessary consumption, unnecessary consumption. In fact, if you're now watching uh, at the time of recording this, uh, one person who has become extremely famous on the Internet is Andrew Tate. He's become famous partly because he keeps throwing money, cars, girls, whatever it is, it's just consumption and it hits the right chord to its audience. This was completely shocking. Where I, you know, grew up was about saving, being careful, don't waste money, a piece of bread after dinner, lunch, whatever would be stored. It, it would, it's offensive if you don't finish your meal Save or if you throw sense. away food. Mm -hmm. It's not about whether the, per the person comes from a rich family or it doesn't matter. It is offensive here. Like you come in and like people like in the middle of 40 degrees, July, summer, they're watering the lawn with drinking water with yes. filtered. I've seen people water their lawn for two hours with filtered water and then they wash the car. And then you're like, okay, hey, neighbor, who is the other car for? You're only a single person. Oh, that other car is for my dog. My dog also likes it. It's just incredible, the level of consumption here. Yes. Unnecessary. Uh, yes, I think, you know, another thing, like, I think that's what you're touching on. In most places, I would say people live within their means. Like, credit is such a big deal. Like, taking out a credit or, like, a loan, or it's a huge deal. Whereas in, you know, I think there's like thousands of debts to every Canadian on a credit card, you know, because it's a common practice. And it, it yeah, it's it was encouraged. very different for us as well. It, it was very different for us as well. The third big surprise I had when I moved to the West from Iran was this profound adherence to authority or those perceived as authority. It was so you think you're back in a, like, you know, a third world country and usually third world countries are a little bit more religious. That is not true. Actually, it's a generalization. I shouldn't say that, but normally it is. And one thing you notice in those countries is that, yes, you know, they go really by the book of whatever religion it is. It's like there's no flexibility. They don't understand the concept that, they, hey, maybe the book was written 2000 years ago because there was no law or their people didn't have the same level of understanding. So not everything is not applicable now. But then you come on this side, th there's still that, that still is present. And I don't wanna talk about necessarily that part, but you go to school and you ask a question, you literally question somebody, you're like, no, that's not what the teacher said. I understand that's not what the teacher said, 
but what they said was dumb or you're crossing the street this was like shocking this was shocking how it's so different there could be absolutely nobody on the street you could be in toronto nobody is on the street it's 2 a.m people stand for that stupid light to turn green before they cross <laughs> the, the, it's so different because in you know iran people even if it's the middle of the day they don't stop for the light so that's such an extreme sort of a but again the shocking part is this adherence to authority and everybody who they perceive doctors lawyers judges politicians just the teachers, somebody wearing a suit. It could just be like, they have done this experiment, literally wearing a suit and everybody listens to that person now all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. But this was very shocking because I was under the impression that this is an open-minded society. There's like, mm -hmm. people have their own thought process. They're just not gonna, which brings me actually to my fourth one. And then we'll get into see what you saw, which is argumentation and arguing with these authority figures, especially is frowned upon rule of law is so in order once you move to the west that you sense the iron fist and the big brother everywhere you go like you're like oh i can feel him breathing down my neck literally genia yes um you know i i think one of the biggest examples i have you know and this is as we said this these are just observations for the majority this is not the case for every person, but one of the things I observed very early on in school was that nobody copied off of anybody ever. Like when I was a child, you know, I was going to school, there were lots of people who didn't do their homework. Like they'd be like, Jenya, can I just like copy your homework? I'd be like, sure, of course. And I, you know, I give them my homework and they, <laughs> you know, if you did that here, it would, people were not understanding like they were like they thought it was so immoral <laughs> like and it's just like you know you're a child like you, you're a kid like you're in a teenager probably went out last night or something I don't know and, yeah, and this, it's like it's a stupid topic it's not like it's you were just gonna homework. kill somebody like who cares yeah. you know and I and I remember that you know I don't want to say it negatively like but like snitching on that type of thing was huge like people would actually tell the teacher oh that person didn't do their homework and they copy it off <laughs> i was so shocked you know and and i think you know with where i'm from and you know there was this uh stereotype like oh you know in the soviet union they always like snitched on each other i was like nobody snitched on homework at least you know? <laughs> so uh, to some extent you yeah i agree with you that authority and sort of rule abiding which is it, it was huge like I've never seen people abide by the law as much until I moved here, which is in many ways a good thing, but it was very shocking initially, yeah. The next one, which is all again related, is fifth big surprise when I moved to the West from Iran was the realization that democracy as advertised outside of the West was not what it exactly was. Is it still better than other places? Yes, that's not the argument here, but it's not as advertised. So what I noticed, and this took a while, this wasn't an immediate realization because I was 15, uh, for the most part, uh, not having the same knowledge I have now, not having the same experience. It's, it's very, very different at the 15 uh, year old versus where I am right now. Eventually, the realization became that these are all connected. Blind adherence to authority, argumentation is frowned upon. That is the democracy that's been orchestrated here. So this is why it's a lot less likely. And people will argue about this, and that's OK. Less likely people will start a demonstration in the West than outside of the West, even though in the West, less likely, not impossible, it's happened in fact in recent history, you're less likely you're gonna get arrested uh, or killed than it is outside, even though that is the case, which is actually a positive, it is less likely. So here, the democracy has been created in such a way where 
there is more layers of control and it's more focused on preventing a revolution than trying to fight it, which is a smart thing to do. So a lot of people actually call this a soft dictatorship versus a hard dictatorship. A soft dictatorship, you got a lot of different personal freedoms up to a certain level. So for example, when you vote, so for example, look at the United States political system, the democracy, how it is, as they define it, which is again, still one of the better ones. So you can't really argue with that again. I'm not arguing with that, but here's what it is at the end, of, at the core of it. It's just a soft dictatorship. Why? You got only two parties to choose from. It's either this guy or that guy. Then the next one is either this guy or that guy, this guy or that guy. And if you look at them, the differences are almost nothing. Same thing in Canada, same thing in the UK, same thing to all the other countries that pretend to be a democracy and they shed on all the other countries outside of them. Quality life, is it better for individuals? Yes, but this is not the true democracy advertised for people who are outside of this system. The other thing I've noticed is that the level of complete control into the most important sectors, which is all as strong as outside education system, healthcare system, politics, military, completely controlled. And while you may have a delusion that you're selecting the top guys, again, I told you, you're not really selecting anyone. There's only two people. Even if the, if the election is correct, it's only two people with very minor differences. Even if that's right, the heads of all these other very important things that should be free in a real democracy, these guys should be independent of the government. They're not. And they have not elected individuals running them, but appointed. Isn't that a classic definition of a dictatorship? You appoint people. So this was a little bit shocking for me. I mean, in the United States, there is a lot more elections. So actually, municipal politics in the United States, for example, is much more of a bigger deal than in Canada. In Canada, and, and yes, say, yeah. we we appoint a lot of offices. We actually don't care about municipal politics as much. Whereas in the United States, it's a much more actually grassroots, if you will, like uh, movement it's in true. terms and of and municipal. You have states that are a little bit separate from the federal. Yeah. They have some independence. Oh, uh, yeah, lots. Yeah. Um, but I will say, yeah, I, I, I think in terms of just seemingness, uh, you know, bottom line is I think why it works. And, you know, you mentioned uh, the difference, you know, between a protest in, a, let's say, a di dictatorship versus uh somewhere like the United States or Canada, it's because majority of people live quite well. That's why the threat of a protest is not as real or is not as threatening uh, because majority of people actually, like the system itself has managed to work out in a way where the majority, again, doesn't mean that the minority should be ignored or, you know, like whatever, we don't care what they do anymore, but the majority of people live well and or fairly well. And therefore, uh, the threat of a revolution <laughs> is less. However, I would say in the latest years, it's changed a lot because we see that the minority that is not living well is not such a minority, actually. It's huge parts of population. So I guess we'll see what happens, but I think the complacency comes from just the fact that a huge part of the population actually does okay. That's true. Now, my last surprise when I moved to the West from Iran was realizing the level of racism, blatant racism, which I didn't think was going to be as bad as that's Remember, expectation, this is a surprise, as I'm telling you, which were cool to see in Iran, not cool to see when I moved to the West. That's, that's why they're a surprise. Not that they're worse, but I noticed that this ignorance we talked about at the very beginning as one of my big surprises of outside world fuels this lack of empathy, lack of understanding anyone that is not like us, us being within this and mostly it goes away. Very interesting, by the way, uh, the level of racism, it doesn't go away. 
but a marker that it shows it's it's essentially ignorance is you notice the level of racism especially if you're a person of color it goes down as you learn to speak english more and more fluently why because you start to at least sound like us so it doesn't go away so if you're not talking and nobody's like listening then it's still there until they realize that oh person can speak English so it's all cool but when I started uh, high school I started high school here was yeah that was rough kids kids don't hold back but it's not about the kids it's when you realize it in teachers for example you're like oh my god this person is like 50 something year old teacher in the class and they're still racist and you will see it they're not overt because again they're remember what we talked about people do adhere to authority they're extremely polite so how do you see these things you'll see the subtle hints of it here and there and it's like twisted words etc or using words such as your people you know that that itself is like ah oh, man this person is being racist what do you mean your people we're all people what does that even mean you like don't say that in front of a class you're teaching you're being an example for so many kids that are going to go out and like now they're going to all tell me your people, your people, because you're an idiot. You don't understand. You shouldn't say that yourself and in the context of a teacher. So that was my last surprise. Should we go to the good surprises? Absolutely. So the good surprises, these were not actually, I guess they're not surprises necessarily, but I, I do want to end with some things that I did really enjoy. I did say at the very beginning that I have had opportunities in the West that I could not have had in my wildest dreams in Iran. And I'm very thankful for those. Uh, they've literally changed my life. They've changed my family's life. So those are good. One of the things that I noticed was that it's a lot easier. So remember, we got a set of rules and a game, just like we got outside. But getting through, even if you want to get into politics, figuring out the rules of the game are much easier than it would be outside you could penetrate any of the systems this could be you want to for example go and be a army general it is possible to get the knowledge and how to with effort you'll get there you're going to go into the highest levels in politics it's possible you want to accumulate incredible wealth and uh, and uh, you know become a let's say start a large business that it's possible so that was i think a very good positive that is not available so this access that second thing is actually access to education healthcare knowledge in general just having access to knowledge of course the knowledge still is comes with some controls of the algorithm now that we live in the internet. So there's always some sort of form of control because governments have to have some control. And remember, governments are created just like any other tribe back in civilization. The top people win. Remember, I told you there's always two people. There's still two people. They want to have as much control as possible, but they do give access so that you don't have revolutions because of like the basic necessities of knowledge. The third one, which I actually listed as a bad thing as well, was the availability of credit. If you know how to use it, you could literally just just even a simple credit card. I'm not talking about loans, a simple credit card. You could use a credit card to become a millionaire. You cannot do that because you, that some countries outside don't even have this sort of a credit system or it's very hard to get those, which is very interesting. And that's very good. And lastly, for the most part, and then we'll see what Jenny has, is the ability to criticize such as what we did today, for the most part, you're at least not going to be killed or jailed. Is there other threats? Well, yeah, you could be deplatformed, you could be canceled. You could do... So you notice there is still soft control over population if it goes against the grain, but it's better than being killed, I would say. You get a fighting chance to come back and figure out the game again. Come around, you're banned if you're banned, for example. It's very different than being jailed or tortured and or killed. So those were the things that I thought were incredibly useful about this society. Shania? Mm -hmm. I will say again, uh, just like you, I, uh, you know, I've had a great life here so far and I, I've enjoyed being here and I'm really grateful that I moved. And one of the things actually I will say 
this. I really loved the people. Uh, you know, you've mentioned, you know, teachers, maybe not always uh, open-minded. and But I've actually had a great experience with um, majority of people in Canada. Again, sure, there are people who make fun of you for your accent or for something else like that. But I will say that majority were pretty open and welcoming. And uh, I'm not saying, again, this is, you know, worse somewhere else, but as an immigrant, it's really important for you to feel that way about, you know, where where you are. And, for example, something like BMO could exist in Canada, where we're from literally everywhere. There's, there's a, we're such a diverse group. I think that's an amazing thing about us. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to think that, you know, that can happen in Canada. Uh, so So people, for sure. Uh, because we're all from, you know, so many immigrants, uh, so many uh, experiences. So I, I think that that's been a wonderful, wonderful experience as an immigrant here. Very good point. Very good point. I've had that experience in the U.S. as well, because these uh, the Western countries normally do attract a lot of immigrants. That is actually a positive because you get to see a lot of different people mixed with the original Call them original again. Most of these countries don't have a huge history except maybe the UK. So you can't really be original. So like literally Canada is called the land of immigrants, right? Yeah. You know, you got a few hundred years of history of Western history in the US and Canada and UK obviously it's, it's a lot more. But the beauty is I've traveled to all these countries is being able to meet people from like really odd places. So it's like almost it's like you travel but you have traveled again while you're traveling because you see other people, you see different cultures, you see their foods, and like it brings essentially the whole entire culture from different parts of the world into one place, which is really interesting. And you're right. I have met a lot of really good people. The majority of the things that's, that has brewed here does allow to have a lot of people who are kind people who are generous and people who come with their perspective that you have never thought about, they always can add something to your knowledge that you never, it, it helps reduce the ignorance when you're an immigrant. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. <laughs> but I think that's, that's essentially what I wanted to talk about today because uh, this has been on my mind. What's the difference? There's a lot of things right now going on back in iran and you know i'm reflecting on what's happening there there's going to be another video me talking about what's happening in iran but i also wanted to uh talk about to see to let people who've never had the opportunity to live outside of the west to get a sense of perception if you have you cannot have an opinion unless you've lived in both worlds right once you've lived in both worlds it's a lot easier to connect the dots and be like, ah, this is good on this part. This is good on that part. This is bad on this part. This is good on that part. But overall, again, I do want to emphasize that, yes, the West has been very much open to progress. And because of that is the reason it will get better. And these things will eventually get improved. They get improved all the time. Whereas outside of the West, when you don't have the systems that are in place here the possibility of change is almost zero like you could move out go back 20 years later you're like shit it's still the same it's still the same like sometimes both in the physical sense of the place there's no progress but also in the way people think it's still exactly the same because it's just so close and very tight control as compared to a soft control that we have in the west so final thoughts Jenia? No, final thoughts are, you know, as, as you mentioned, it's always good to be aware of both sides of the, you know, question. You know, what is good, what is bad about where you live? We're lucky to be living here. We just need to be obviously questioning, even, even here, and uh, improving what it is. Only by questioning will we do that. Exactly. Well, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, Feel free to share it with a friend, subscribe on whatever social media channel you're watching this, and hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.